Welcome back. We're on our way to a real romp through history. Not with a bunch of long-haired tourists that occasionally roughed up the neighbors, but the most fearsome bandits in history. Have you ever wondered why we call the place that holds our money a bank? Probably not. But when you think about it, bank is an odd word for its function. So where did the word bank come from? From the most accomplished robbers in history. A large settlement nestled along a seacoast bustles with life. Wisps of smoke waft from chimneys in turf and stone dwellings. The laughter of small children is heard as families till the soil, feed their animals, and gather their gardens. A bell rings frantically from the little church nearby. All life stops as a fleet of square sails breaks the horizon. Sleek ships powered by furious rowers. Ships led by prows of carved dragons and serpents heading straight toward them. Everyone scatters, grabbing children, animals, baskets of grain, foodstuffs, and skins of water. Anything and everything needed for survival. They flee toward the caves and outcrops of rock, making a run for it as fast as they can, hoping for a place to hide. The sea raiders splash ashore. First they head for the church. That's where the silver is. Some chase after potential captives. Others chase pigs and oxen left behind. Still others pillage the huts, then set them ablaze. When their work is done and their cargo secure, they set sail. Row north and hug the coast, comes the chieftain's command. Find a sandbank. There, comes the call. Row hard and run her aground. Crews turn their ships to the tides, then beach their vessels into hillsides of sand. Whooping and howling, the sea robbers jump into the surf. Dig a hole, they sing. Dig it deep and put it in the bank. So next time you go to the ATM, remember it was the Vikings who made it all possible. The year was 793. The place, the holy island of Lindisfarne off the northeast coast of Britannia, famous center of English learning perched on the edge of the North Sea. In the early dawn hours, bands of sea raiders sweep in on their dragon ships, sliding smoothly onto pristine sand. The only sound across the seacoast is a single bell tolling the call to prayer. Then, the quiet rasp of gravel, the clink of weapons, and the heavy breath of men. With unmatched barbarity, the raiders rapidly cut the monks down so that not one escapes. Monks killed as they stand in the holy place, their bodies trampled like dung in the streets. Those still alive stripped naked and carried off in chains, are cast into the sea to drown. Jewel-encrusted covers of precious manuscripts ripped off, their holy pages of vellum cast to the winds. Abbey pillaged, monastery plundered. Easy pickings, for monks are of little use in battle. The Isle of Britannia is shaken to its core. Monks perished, but the story survived fiery dragons flying in the sky, raging whirlwinds and jagged lightning, omens of terror of the sixth age of the world, only the seventh and final to come. Lindisfarne would not be the first or last blood splash day. The stories had only begun. Of Eric Bloodaxe, Thorfinn the Skull Splitter, Thorolf Lousebeard, names that match the man, Ragnar Harry Breaches, Ivar the Boneless, Seagird Snake in the Eye, who cut off the head of Melbrick the Toothy and hung it from his saddle, Harrod Mophead, who never cut or combed his hair, Halfton the Generous with Money but Stingy with Food, and the Giant Berserker, Thorkel the Tall, Fierce Marauder who'd go berserk with battle madness. Sure, not a group of long-haired tourists who occasionally roughed up the neighbors. Northmen, Nordic pirates who call themselves Vikings. Sea raiders who never rested their oars, scouting another target, another blood splash day, another bank. Today, 
on the holy island of Lindisfarne, near the ruins of a monastery, is a museum of antiquities. One of its treasures is a large fragment of carved stone, a heavy arch-shaped standing stone believed to be a grave marker placed not long after the Viking raid of 793. On one side are carved seven figures, a row of warriors, aggressive, warlike, advancing in line, clad in mail shirts, brandishing swords and axes high above their heads, a vivid picture of a Viking onslaught. On the opposite side is carved a great cross that points to the heavens. Two figures at the foot of the cross kneel in prayer as two large hands hover protectively above. In the cosmos above the cross are the circle of the sun and a crescent moon, perhaps to symbolize that terror could strike day or night. It is not known if this ancient stone was carved to represent Armageddon, the end of the world, but the monks of Lindisfarne likely thought so. Perhaps it was a reminder of the prayer known by every man, woman, and child in the known world. A furora norde minorum libero nos domine. From the fury of the Northmen, O Lord, deliver us. A prayer heard in every town and village for three centuries. The age of the Viking had come. Many factors contributed to the phenomenal success of the Vikings. The undaunted will of a band of brothers who could expertly wield the double-sided war axe and the barb-pointed spear, then handle with powerful precision their blood-hardened swords. Swords were prized and personal, so personal they gave them names like Legbiter and Viper and always held by the warrior at the moment of death. But their greatest weapon by far was the longship, soul of the Viking, superb instrument of sea power, wielded with matchless skill as they left their fjords to seek their fortunes and satisfy their land hunger. Designed like a serpent, thin and flexible, the longship bent with the waves and rode atop the waters like a mythical sea serpent, an elusive creature not mythical to the Vikings. But no matter what they believed about the seas they sailed, their longships were marvels of engineering. Still today, the model for modern battleships. Draca, soul of the Viking, dragon-headed longships that could cross the open seas under sail, then switch to oars for lightning-fast hit-and-run attacks, and easily carry loads of loot or extra passengers like captives. Warships could cause the dragon prows to move up and down, to pass under bridges, and to make the ships appear as beasts alive and poised to strike their prey. Strong, sleek, and sturdy, held together with planking no thicker than a man's finger, the long ship was sealed watertight with plated animal hair, tarred rope, and iron bolts, painted with bright and bold colors, equipped with a single square sail. Other ships at sea had to turn around to reverse course, not the long ship. Built the same at both ends, the crew had only to turn themselves around and row the other direction. Sailing far up rivers or riding out the fiercest storms of the ocean, the long ship's shallow hull could navigate water only one meter deep, perfect when looking for a bank. When landing to invade and raid, the crew lifted up the boats, carried them across ground to another river, and rowed further inland to plunder another town. To make camp for the night, they turned the ship's bottom up for shelter. If a fortified bridge stood in their way, they landed their longboats, dragged the vessels around it, placed them back in the water, and continued rowing. Not even an icy winter stopped them. They'd set up base camps on an island in the river. No local dared to bother them. When spring came, they just rowed up river to resume their raiding, and no matter where they went, they always left something behind. Not an eye left open to view the dead. This was the world of Emma of Normandy, a world overshadowed by those who shared the same blood as she. Many tales were told about a sea-cast flood of invaders who brought fear and fury, and oh, what tales they were.
Tales of the last days of the world when the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Of marauders who roasted the bodies of their slain enemies impaled on spits. Formidable fighting men who could catch javelins in their bare hands and hurl them back on their foes. Ferocious men who executed the blood eagle. Gruesome ritual that only revved up the tales. Those sea devils who went a Viking certainly had stones and left a lot of bones. The Northmen in their fury carved a path from England to the Arctic, from Africa to Baghdad. No longer was the English Channel a barrier, it was a boulevard. No coast was safe, no inland river secure, no village untouched, no church spared from the gleam of steel and the scent of murder. A true band of brothers, as good at the oar as with the sword as much at home on the water as on the land. These masters of the sea assaulted England and Europe for ten generations, cutting their way with their swords, then planting themselves deeply in the soil. Founders of Iceland and Greenland, even touching North America for a time, Vikings established themselves in Britain, Ireland, and Normandy, land of the Northmen. And no Viking did this better than Rolf the Dane, Rollo, a Viking's Viking, a Northman who became the first Norman, a Norse chief so mountainous he was called the Walker, for it was said no horse could carry him. Rollo, great-grandfather of Our Lady with her bones in a box. Northmen became Normans, Rollo became Robert, northern France became Normandy, and Robert and his descendants became the Dukes of Normandy. Normans, sea kings who forged a Viking settlement into the greatest military state in all of France, a kingdom within a kingdom whose descendants became expert in the art of statecraft. Yes, Emma's ancestors never forgot where the banks were, But she never forgot where the blood bank was, for she learned well the art of statecraft, that a kingdom may be won by sword and arrow, but a kingdom is kept by cunning and control. For power can never be abolished. It always finds its way into someone's hands. Yes, the lady learned well the art of statecraft, that there is one crown but many heads it will fit. It is a wise ruler who removes those heads. So she made sure the crown was fitted to her head and to the heads of those of her blood. For her Viking blood ran deep. It's what made her tick, what made her a tough little cookie. She had grit. When faced with another obstacle, Queen Emma was asked, what will you do now? She answered, whatever's necessary. No Viking said it better. We invite you to share stones and bones with those who love history, those who love all things medieval and Viking, those who love all things royal, and especially those who love stories of strong and influential women in history. Please like and share the Stones and Bones podcast on your social media. When we return, Deborah will introduce us to the gruesome practice performed by the Vikings to which those who lived in their world needed no introduction.